a bank that can't meet its reserve requirement borrows from a bank that has excess reserves in the federal funds market and the quantity supplied of reserves remains unchanged. Why would the quantity of reserves supplied remain unchanged? Well, imagine Bank A has a million dollars in excess reserves and these reserves are in its account at the Federal Reserve Bank branch that it does business with. Bank B does business with that same Federal Reserve branch. But Bank B was a little too aggressive making loans and as a result it's a million dollars shy of meeting its reserve requirement. So Bank B will call up Bank A and say, hey I notice you have a million dollars of excess reserves at the Fed, um, can I borrow that from you? And if Bank A says yes, they'll say yes, but yet you have to pay me interest. Well, Bank B will pay back the million dollars with interest, and the interest is computed using the federal funds interest rate. Okay. Now imagine you're in the vault at the Federal Reserve, and there's a stack of cash a stack of million dollars in the corner with Bank A's name on it. When this, traction, when this transaction goes uh, down, all the Fed basically does is take down Bank A's name on that, on that uh, stack of cash and put Bank B's name on it. So that's why the quantity of reserves remains unchanged. Now the vertical part of the reserve supply curve is the amount of reserves the Fed supplies the federal funds market. When banks are lending between themselves, the quantity of reserves doesn't change. But when the when banks borrow from the Fed, the quantity of reserves changes. So when the banks borrow from the Fed, discount loans rise, borrowed reserves increase, the quantity of reserves supplied increases. When banks sell U.S. Treasury securities to the Fed, non borrowed reserves increase, which increases the quantity of reserves. Hence, the supply of reserves, the vertical part, is the sum of non borrowed reserves and borrowed reserves. Now, the horizontal part of the reserve supply curve is the discount rate. Now, remember, this: the discount rate ID is the interest rate the Fed charges banks banks who can't meet the reserve requirement have to meet the reserve requirement. They can either borrow from other banks or they can borrow from the Federal Reserve. If they borrow from the Federal Reserve, they pay an interest rate of equal to the discount rate. Now the federal funds rate is less than the discount rate. Banks will not borrow from the Fed because this, if you want to call it big withdrawal insurance, purchase from the Fed is more expensive than from other banks. So when the federal funds rate is less than discount rate, banks go to other banks. They don't go to the Federal Reserve. Now the federal funds rate is more than discount rate. Banks will want to borrow from the Fed instead of other banks for the opposite reason. This so-called big withdrawal insurance purchased from other banks is more expensive than it is from the Fed. Okay, so let's do an example here. Suppose borrowed reserves equals $3 billion and non-borrowed reserves equals $25 billion and the discount rate is 3%. Below, graph the supply of reserves. The vertical part is just the sum of borrowed reserves and non-borrowed reserves, so $28 billion. Okay. The horizontal part is just the discount rate, which equals 3. So the supply of reserves curve starts at 28, takes a right at 3. Okay, let me do that again. The supply of reserves in the federal funds market is the kinked supply curve that starts at 28 and takes a right at 3. We label that L-shaped diagram the supply of reserves. Now, the equilibrium in the federal funds market is determined by the intersection of demand and supply.
if now what we're gonna what I'm gonna show you is if the federal funds rate is less than discount rate, a bank would rather borrow from the banks. We've talked about it before. The quantity reserves would be equal to the sum of non borrowed reserves and borrowed reserves. If the demand for reserves intersects the horizontal section of the supply curve, the federal funds rate equals the discount rate and the Fed's got to do some discount lending. So the discount rate is kind of like acting like a price ceiling on borrowing for banks who need to meet the reserve requirements. It's kind of like a price ceiling. A bank is indifferent at this point between borrowing from banks or the Fed because if they borrow from other banks, they're paying the federal funds rate, which equals the discount rate. So they're indifferent between who they're going to borrow from. However, the bank borrows from the Fed because something, a crisis, um, has dried up all excess reserves held by the banks. So all at this point, all excess reserves are gone. There are no excess reserves left. And so even though banks would like to lend out their excess reserves at the federal funds rate, they can't because they're all dried up. So the Fed has to come in and lend money via the discount window which means it makes loans at the discount rate. The equilibrium quantity of reserves exceeds the quantity of non-borrowed reserves and borrowed reserves. So the difference between the equilibrium of quantity of reserves and the quantity of non-borrowed reserves plus borrowed reserves is the quantity of discount loans made by the Fed. So in our example here, um, the reserve requirement ratio is 10%. Uh, the amount of money in checkable in checking accounts is 50 billion. Um, the worst case scenario required reserves or excess reserves banks want to hold is 25 billion. The slope of the demand curve is one. And then over on the supply side, borrowed reserves are three, non-borrowed reserves are 25, and the discount rate is 3%. Well, if you remember, the demand for reserves was given by the equation the federal funds rate equals 30 minus the quantity demanded for reserves. Okay, And remember, when the federal funds rate was 2, quantity demanded for reserves was 28. When the federal funds rate was 5, quantity demanded for reserves was 25. And then the demand for reserves is just a line connecting these two dots. The vertical part of the supply curve was 28, right? 3 plus 25. The horizontal part of the supply curve was equal to 3, the discount rate. So the supply for reserves is the L-shaped um, line that starts at 28, goes up to 3, and takes a right. So here, the, federal, the demand for reserves intersects the vertical section of the supply curve. So the equilibrium, according to this diagram, is 28, which equals the quantity of barred reserves and non-barred reserves. And now since the um, supply curve for reserves crosses the demand curve at a federal funds rate of 2, the equilibrium federal funds rate is 2. Okay, So that's the equilibrium right there. The equilibrium federal funds rate is 2. The equilibrium quantity reserves is 28. Now, suppose the Fed increases the discount rate to 4%. What happens? What we want to know is what happens to the equilibrium. Well, if the, federal, if the Fed raises the discount rate to 4, the new horizontal section is now at height 4. So the supply... There's no change in the vertical section. The supply, there's no change in the equilibrium federal funds rate and the discount rate. So raising the discount rate in this scenario has no impact on the money supply. Now starting on uh, the 1st of 2003, the Fed began setting the discount rate 100 basis points, or one percentage point, above its federal funds rate target. So the Fed raises the discount rate, then it intended to raise the federal funds rate by one percentage point or 100 basis points.
So, um, if the Fed wants the federal funds rate at 2, it won't raise the discount rate to 4. If the Fed wants the federal funds rate set at 3, then it'll raise the discount rate to 4. Okay. Now, suppose the, instead the Fed increases the reserve required ratio to 14%. Show how this effect will change the uh, equilibrium. Now remember, the reserve requirement ratio was 10%. Check on deposits were 50 billion, and worst case scenario, excess reserves were 20 billion. So what do you do here? Well, we replace the 10% with 0.14 or 14%. 14% times 50 is 7. 7 plus 25 is 32. To graph the demand for reserves, all we have to do is recognize the fact that the new demand curve will be parallel to the old demand curve. And since we know that borrowed reserves and non-borrowed reserves equals 28, we can plug that into here. We're going to plug 28, the quantity of reserves in the federal funds market, we're going to plug that which is equal to 25 plus 5, the, or 25 plus 3, the, the borrowed reserves plus the non-borrowed reserves. We're going to plug this number into our demand curve. And that's just 32 minus 28, which is 4. So the demand curve, the new demand curve, must pass through this point. So the demand curve shifts to the right. So what's the new equilibrium federal funds rate? Well, the equilibrium federal funds rate is 3. And the new equilibrium quantity of reserves is found by solving the supply curve with the new red demand curve for reserves. So I'm going to replace the federal funds rate with 3. And then I'm going to solve that for the quantity demand for reserves, which is 29. So what's going on here? When the Fed raises the reserve requirement ratio, all excess reserves in the system dry up and banks are having a hard time meeting their reserve requirement. So this means the banks have to go to the emergency source of lending, the Fed. And the Fed, because it raised the reserve requirement ratio, now all of a sudden has to make $1 billion in discount loans to banks so the banks can meet the reserve requirement ratio. Now, in the past, the Fed has tried slowing the economy by increasing the reserve requirement ratio. Doing this creates a big collapse in bank lending to businesses and consumers. In addition, the Fed has to make discount loans to banks because excess reserves dry up. So even though total reserves have increased via discount lending, this cash is sitting idle. The effect is a reduction in the money supply which raises the nominal rate of interest. Now, if inflation remains unchanged, the increase in the nominal rate of interest increases the real rate. A higher real rate of interest decreases private investment, and both these collapse aggregate demand. In addition, the higher real rate of interest means that foreigners are turning their currencies into dollars so that they can buy U.S. Treasury securities at these higher real rates of interest. Now, this drives up the value of the dollar, which makes our goods, when we export them to other countries, more expensive, which lowers our exports. Now, because of these three shifters of aggregate demand, it can have a, a seriously adverse effect on the economy shown in the diagram. In the diagram, we have aggregate demand and aggregate supply crossing at a point that implies there's an inflationary gap. Well, when all three of these factors uh, wield their effect on aggregate demand, you may see a huge decline in aggregate demand. In the diagram below, we show aggregate demand shifted in so much so that the price level falls and real GDP is falls so much that it's lower than full employment output. In the past, small increases in the reserve requirement ratio have put a hot economy, one that is growing too fast, into a recessionary gap. As a result, the Fed rarely changes the reserve requirement ratio, and it has not changed it since 1992.